And let's see here. I gotta turn myself on. Okay, yeah. That sounds like me. <laughs> I think you would uh, recognize it if it weren't me. Uh, it's good to be here. You know, it's, uh, it's a little bit cool in Texas, but it's not this cool. <laughs> and it gets cold in Texas, but it never gets as cold as it does here. So we are... Uh, we have been to Canada before. We've never been to Camrose before. And uh, one time we were up for uh, All Canada Day. And was that Toronto? I believe it was, wasn't it? Toronto. And uh, I got up and about 500 people there, as I recall, from all over Canada. And uh, I told them I was happy to be there, and we sang the Canadian National Anthem, which I, standing on the platform, I had a little trouble with that. I couldn't <laughs> keep the words going. And I told them that, and they kind of chuckled about that. And then I said, well, one thing I want to tell you. I said, it's good to be here, but I said, you people sure do talk funny. <laughs> and, of course, I emphasized the drawl, the southern drawl, and... Uh, they understood immediately. They thought, well, <laughs> you think we talk funny. You sound terrible. But it's uh, other than the, the after a while, you'll get adjusted to the sounds and the way I pronounce words, and uh, we'll get along together well. You know, one of the things, uh, I, I, sometimes I tell this, but probably I'll tell it here too. People down in, uh, in the States will say, <clears throat> You've been 52 years in one church, yeah. Only preacher they ever had until seven months ago. That's right. How in the world did that happen? And I tell the story that I've heard that fits. It didn't happen to me, but it fits what I want to tell you. And that is, there was this church that always just kept a preacher for one year. And after one year, they told him that probably be best that he'd move on. And so they, they were pretty noticeable uh, among churches that they never kept preacher two years. And so uh, this fellow went there to preach, and he preached one, one year, and then they said, we want you to stay another year. Well, he thought that was strange, but he didn't ask. And so he stayed the second year, and they asked him to stay the third year. And he said, folks, he said, you know, you've never had preachers stay longer than one year. And now you're asking me to stay three years. He said, why is that? And they said, well, it's kind of like this. We never did want much preacher anyway. And you're the nearest nothing we've ever found. <laughs> so if you want to have an explanation that's how you do it you near you pretty much fit what we were looking for and so you stay for 52 years uh, it's been a great time and we've loved it and uh, people sometimes make fun of me when i go somewhere and they say i hope it didn't offend you i said i live with that every day at home so it doesn't mean a thing to me that's just fine one of the things that uh, that I, one of my favorite themes to talk about is something that today is, uh, it's really in vogue. And by that I mean people love to say, well, the Bible is an old book and we're a modern people and you just can't take the Bible for what it says, you, you just it's just too far out of date. It's not practical. Oh, it's a great ideal, and, and I, we ought to read it every once in a while just to be inspired, but it, it's not really a practical thing to live by. And so I love to take that theme and say, uh, let's explore that. Let's see what that means. For instance, all of us have needs. And the interesting thing is, 
that people assume the Bible and God and the inspired men didn't know what our needs were. And so what they told us was, wouldn't it be nice if we could live right here and do this? But in reality, life is down here. And they kind of view the Bible like that. You, you look at it, you read it, you say, hey, it's good, but hey, I can't do that. And it's not even real anyway. It's just, it's just too far out. I want to take that as our theme. And, and I want us to ask this question. What is it? What is it that we want out of life? What are we trying to get? And anytime anybody faces that question, then you have to ask yourself, what does the Bible really address that? And uh, a fellow by the name of Abraham Maslow years ago came up with uh, uh, the needs of people, and, and he didn't do this from a religious viewpoint, and I'm not presenting these as Maslow's uh, hierarchy, but there, there are things that we need, and they tend to go in the, kind of like climbing a ladder. You know, when you get on the first step, then you're able to go to the next step, and you get to the next, you can go to the third, and so forth. And so Maslow said, when you meet this need, you move on to the next need. Well, God understood that. Kind of like to ask some kids one time. And they said, uh, little kids, they said, do you think God understands space travel? And they said, no, God's too old to know about that. That's new. <laughs> and that's pretty well where people, you know, their mind goes. They, they think God's, he, he's out there, and he's in Never Never Land, and he, uh, he, he's so ancient and so far back that he doesn't understand what we need. See, we've got some folks still coming in. I guess they're going to open the door and let them in here. But anyway, more the merrier. Yeah, come on in. Uh, so, uh, so what we do, as, as I, I, I sat down one time and I started thinking about this, I said, what is it that I really want out of life? What do you want out of life? And the interesting thing is that Maslow was right. We have this need, and when we get that one met, we move on to the next one. For instance, the... Uh, a fellow says, uh, you know, if I could only be a millionaire. And so he gets to be a millionaire. And then he says, but you know, there are people in the world that are multi-millionaires. And I'm just a millionaire. And so he moves on to the next thing. Uh, I read about uh, a, a man who was bragging about his wife. He said, you know, he said... Uh, my wife said, why do you love your wife? He said, because she made me a millionaire. He said, how did she do that? What did you used to be? He said, I used to be a multimillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she brought him down and took care of that extra million, and he became a millionaire. Well, if you're a millionaire, you're not going to ever find a millionaire that's happy being a millionaire. They want to be a multimillionaire. And if they got five million, then somebody else has ten million, and they're not happy until they get to that spot. So let's uh, let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the bottom. What what is the bottom need that we all have? I, I, let me tell you. I, when I was in um, grade school. Our fourth grade teacher used to read a book to us at after lunch in the rest time. I don't know if you ever did that. And they don't do it in school much anymore, but they did in my day. And she read to us Swiss Family Robinson. Now that's another version of Robinson Crusoe. That's what it is. And it's they're washed up on a desert island and they try to survive and they're going to have something to eat and someplace to stay in 
that, that, that was the story. That's the plot. But when you're born into this world, that is one of the first things you have to worry about is can I get what's called in the legal, I, I had a couple of guys taking business law when I was in school. I didn't take it, but I listened to them study it, so I learned some terms. There's a thing called the necessaries of life. And the necessaries are food, clothing, and shelter. Got something to eat, got something to wear, got a roof over my head. Those are the necessaries of life. And so there's some legal implication to that. As you say, uh, you sell a minor something and it's not a necessary of life, it's a luxury. Uh, you got a problem in court getting your money back if he defaults on you. So that's the way they looked at it. But here's what, here's what uh, we find in our lives. We have to be concerned if we don't have anything to eat. That's the number one priority. Got to find something to eat. If we don't have anything to wear uh, and the climate is not favorable, then we're looking for something to wear. Now, something to wear is not what the women say, you know. She's got 75 dresses in her closet and she says, I have nothing to wear. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about really nothing to wear. It, it, it's, a, it's a cold place to live if you have nothing to wear. And then, in addition, to the food and the clothing, then shelter. Then you say, where am I going to live? Are going to live in a cave? Are going to live in a tree? Are you going to make a bamboo hut? Am I going to, what am I going to do? Mud hut? Eskimo? Bricks of snow? What? But everybody's got to worry about that. You've got to think about that because that's the baseline. And you say, well, now, now I've got something to eat, something to wear, and I've got a roof over my head. Now I can be happy. No, sorry. Now you go up the next step of the ladder. Now you've done that, and you've got to move on. So the Bible addresses that. Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. He was talking to his people, to his disciples, and to people who followed him across the Galilean hills. And he said to them, in Matthew chapter 6, you, you know where it is, but Matthew 6, he talks about this and he says, here's what I want you to know. Do not worry about your life, about what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? And then he says, look up here. He said, look at the birds. Look at them. Those birds do not sow and they don't reap and they don't gather into barns, but your father feeds them. And they're not of much value. They're, they're relatively cheap in value. He said, you're more value than they are. Don't worry about something to eat. I am going to take care of you. I'm going to see to it that you make it. And then he says, and what I want to ask you this, he said, why are you worrying about clothes? And then he points over to the Palestinian lily. And he said, look at this lily in the field. It doesn't toil. It doesn't spin. And look how God clothes the lily. It's beautiful. So he took the things at hand and said, your father knows what you need. And if you don't understand that, he said, you will get on a treadmill of worry and God knows what you need to eat, to wear, and to have shelter and he'll take care of it. So here's the question. Why do people have trouble with that? Well it's for this reason. In 1 Timothy 6 the Apostle Paul writes Timothy and he said, Timothy and this is where the Bible gets misquoted. You'll see people say, well, we all know money's the root of all evil. Misquote, Bible doesn't say that. Never did say that. Money is not the root of all evil. Nothing wrong with money. Money is good if you use it for a good purpose. It's bad if you use it for a bad purpose, but money is just money. But he said, if you would be 
rich. You'll fall in temptation and snare of the devil. You get on the treadmill, you can't get enough. And that's what I said about the multimillionaires. It, you, there's always somebody that has more. There's always somebody that's number one, and I'm number two, and I don't feel good if I'm number two. I've got to keep trying. But if you said, he says, if you have some, something to eat and something to wear and a place to live, he said, be there with content. Be content. So that's the baseline. So everybody wants that. Everybody wants to know they can live. So now that we've got that step taken care of on the ladder, we're going to step to the next rung of the ladder. What is the next one? Well, this is subjective on my part, but uh, I'm making the speech, so I'll make it up as I go. Uh, I believe the second one is, what is my status among those who have enough to eat, enough to wear, and a place to live? What is my status? You say, well, I don't really care what my status is, but you know, if you watch human beings, it's not true. Have you ever heard the phrase, uh, the pecking order of the chicken yard? You know, you got one chicken who nobody ever pecks, and you got one at the bottom of the thing and everybody pecks, mm -hmm. and then you got everybody in between. So you got one who's the boss of the outfit, and one who's the slave and the servant of the whole outfit and has no status at all. We, we worry about if we're recognized. Mm -hmm. We want to be recognized for something. Uh, everybody wants to be important. If uh, someone snaps a picture of a group and gives you a copy, which face do you look for first? <laughs> Yourself, that's right. I, did I look good? A woman told me, she was talking about our uh, picture director at Waterloo, and she said, I just want you to look. She said, in these pictures, all the wives look good. <laughs> and if there's any doubt, they choose the wife's picture. That's the reason, the one she likes. And if her husband looks like a goof, that's okay. <laughs> because she looks good. And I got to look at the pictures, and it's true. You know, he's looking cross-eyed. Well, that's okay, but I look wonderful. My hair is right in place. So we, we want to know how we stack up. How, how do we fit in? Uh, President Teddy Roosevelt was an interesting fellow. He was a great activist, you know, and he, he brought a lot of energy to the presidency. And uh, his wife had an interesting comment about him. She said, you know, she said, Teddy wants to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. <laughs> In other words, he wants to be prominent. He wants people to know who he is. Sometimes it's been called the drum major complex. If you see the band coming down, the drum major's out front and he's twirling and he's, he's doing all kinds of gyrating. You know who the drum major is. And people get the drum major conflict and complex because they want to be number one. Now, how do we know this? Well, because we have ways of rank. We, we show people what our rank is. In the Army, it's pretty easy to tell. They got a bar on their shoulder, and it's either a, a gold bar, one gold bar, or it might be, what's the second lieutenant? It might be a silver bar, which means he's a first lieutenant, and of course he goes up immeasurably in status when he goes from second Louis to first. And then when he has two gold bars, he's a captain, and then he gets the oak leaves of a major. And so when you meet the guy, you don't have to say, now how do you fit into the system here? Just look right on the shoulder, he'll tell you. Who gives the orders? One of the biggest braids and stripes and whatever. And, and so we understand that, and the Army is built that way. I was, uh, we went down to uh, Austin, which is a lot of retired military down there. And someone loaned us uh, the home they had down there to go down for the weekend. 
And uh, the fellow next door was a retired pennies store executive, department store. And he gave us a little insight. He said, now, down here, all these, they had mailboxes, everybody had their name on them. He said, down here, you can call a man by his rank. If he's a colonel, you can call him colonel. Or, he said, you can call him Joe if his name is Joe. He said, what you dare not do is don't call him Mr. He won't, if you're going to call him and be something other than warm and f informal, then he wants the rank. And I got to watch him go down the mailboxes, Colonel, General, Major, uh, every one of them had their rank on the mailbox. So nobody would miss it. Nobody would say, oh, what is your place in the order of things? What in the pecking order? What are you? Well, um, yeah. <laughs> General, you know, just just a brigadier though. I'm just got one star. Oh really? Well, the other guy's got two. There's a major general across the road. Yeah. You know? Oh well, that's too bad. I wish I was a major general. You, you see, it's all right there, but it's all worked out. Now we work it out in business. When you go into a company, the guy that's got the corner office usually is the man with the rank, or he's got the biggest desk. A fellow told me, he, he did this, he went into a company and he didn't like the desk and he said to the guy in charge of assignments, he said, would you get me another desk? I, I want one like this, I want a bigger desk. And the guy said, yes sir, okay. And he brought him something back. He said, that is not the size I wanted, I want one of these like this. And he said, oh, okay. And he went back and he came back and he got him something else and he said, what is the problem that you can't get a desk I asked for? He, and he said, you won't really want to know? He said, well, yeah. He said, the president of this company in the corner office has a desk this big and you are not going to get one bigger than his. Is that clear enough? Oh, see, he was violating the pecking order. He was violating the status system. And... Uh, he said, you can't do that. And you say, well, I don't see why. Well, go talk to the president, he'll explain it to you. But you will not have it. Very, some very dramatic things about status. The interesting thing, though, is that Jesus in Matthew 23 gives us a little look-see into the religious community of Jesus' day. And here's what he said. He said, the rabbis love to be hailed in the marketplace and called hail rabbi. And they want the chief seats at the synagogue. And they want to be known as the best or the greatest or the most or whatever. So, you see, this even gets into the kingdom of God the spiritual things. The interesting thing is this, though. God knew that. Are you surprised? He, he really knew. He created us and he put that drive in us to want to be significant. And he said, you want to be great? You want to have everything that you need to sustain yourself? Trust God, he's going to get it for you. Just go out and work like the birds do. And, and I said a while ago, the birds don't sow or gather in the barns. But I, I don't want to leave the impression birds don't work. They work hard. In fact, birds work hard to get something to eat than most anybody in the world. They, they're working all day long, every day, trying to find something to eat. So they work, but he said the Father takes care of them. When they do what they're supposed to do, he'll reward them. He said, he'll do you that way. And you say, I want to be significant. I want to be noticed. I want to know where I fit in. He said, okay, I've got the answer. And here's the answer. It's in Matthew 23, or Matthew 20 rather, not 23. Matthew 20. Here's what he said. He said, if you want to be the greatest, be the servant of everybody. And the 
like, whoa, wait a minute, that does not add up. How can I be great if I serve everybody? He said, you will be. And only those who try that discover that it's true. Have you ever watched people that are just always trying to be number one and always trying to get everybody to recognize them and they're almost uh, pathetic about it? Then people just say, oh yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, he's that way, he's doing that, she's doing that, she always has to be that. But if you want to hear the person who gets elevated up, Find the person who has served everybody and is kind and listens and is interested in you and things need to be done. They do those things. And when people come time to spontaneously honor someone, they pick that person. They said, you know, I feel good about them. I, I will grudgingly give somebody else recognition, but I will just give it away to them. Happy to do so. He said, that's it. The way up is down. The way down is up. It's a paradox, but it's real. It's counterintuitive, but it's real. So he said, I, I knew you'd want to know where you fit in. And Jesus didn't say, shame on you disciples that you want to be number one. You want to be the greatest. That's a, that's a terrible motivation. You're one of God's children. You shouldn't want to do that. He didn't say that at all. He said, you want to be number one? Great. Serve everybody. You'll be great. Well, I wasn't, the Lord didn't quite have that in mind. I wanted to do it another way. Well, he said, that's the only way. That's the way up. Jesus, the greatest man who ever walked the earth, and he served everybody. He died for them. They said, well... That's a nice ideal. Baloney, that is real. That's right. That's truth. And if you'll just look around and clearly, clearly examine your experience, you will find the people you love to honor are the people who are the servants. We were, I was up talking one time. We went to Bible Land some years ago on a trip, and my wife and I did. And, and uh, later in the sermon, I was talking about uh, someone, and I said, you know, there's a fellow, and I didn't call his name, but he went with us, and all the way, anything came up, he'd say, you want me to stay back and help with this? Do you want me to go take care of that? Do you want me to be sure this is working? And you bet, Leo, yeah, do that, that's fine. We got ready to leave and he went into the uh, uh, Israeli uh, diamond store, jewelry, and the state runs that. And uh, so we had a whole bus full load of people and I was the bus captain, which simply meant I'm the guy that could decide if we ever came back there again. So they always want to do something for you. So they said, you know, you get the huge discount. And we talked it over and we said, we. We don't want any in the jewelry. We don't need it. And this man said, uh, our guide said, uh, his name, by the way, was Moses. I thought that was nice. He said, uh, uh, Mr. Oldsby said, uh, would, would Mr. Leo said, would, uh, if you don't want that discount, could I just give it to him? I said, absolutely. I'd be tickled for you to give it that discount. So he got this, I think it's like 75% discount or something. It's really good. Now, did I say, well, okay, yeah, I'll go ahead and give it to him. No, I'm happy to give it away. Love to. I, I wished I'd thought of it myself. I didn't realize it would make a difference. But he says, number one, now, Leo could have called me any day any night, any hour, and said, I need you to come over here. I'd go without even questioning. He called me and said, I need a hundred dollars. I'd take it to him. If he said, I need a thousand, I'd take it to him. Why? He's a great servant. And I want to do it. Not must, I want to. And this tells you about leadership, by the way. Leadership is making people want to follow you. 
and then follow you if you're the greatest servant around. So on the second step, first we've got to get something where we can stay alive, eat, drink, wear it, all that, have a house. Then we say, well, let me see among all these people, how am I fitting in? Am I important? And then thirdly, if I get that done, this is the third thing that I think pops up. And that is, um, you know, I'm going to be on this earth a while and you've had the experience of uh, having money, at the, having month at the end of the money. If you notice that, it sometimes doesn't come out either. So you get to thinking about that and so you want to take care of the future and so you want to accumulate something. Now, you don't have to communicate or accumulate stuff in vast amounts, but you'd like to think, well, when I get to where I can't get out and do this and work, I'd like for my, I've worked for my money and now I want my money to work for me. So you try to accumulate that. Well, you say, well, God, yeah, does God care about that? Yeah, he does. Let me tell you why I know. We say God loves poor people. Abraham Lincoln once said, uh, God must love poor people. He made so many of them. Well, okay. God must love poor people. Most of us are middle class or under that. But I got a flash for you. God loves rich people. Abraham in his day was rich. Now, he didn't have the kind of riches you might want to carry home with you and put in the bank. He had sheep, oxen, donkeys, everything. But he was rich. King David was rich. King Solomon was really rich. God loved every one of them. God, in fact, is profit-minded. You ever thought about that? He is profit-minded. You say, how do you know that? Because he says, take this seed and plant this apple seed, and that one seed gets you an apple tree. And the tree gives you apples, and you open each one, and there's a whole bunch more seeds. And he put one little seed in the ground and you wind up with who knows how many in a tree and how many in a lifetime of that tree. He's profit-minded. He said, you, you got to go out, the parable of the sword Jesus talked about, you go out and sow the seed. And some, he said, won't work at all. It'll die on there and other will do this and give out. But he said, some of it will come forth 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's Luke 8 telling us that. God says, I want this world to last. And if you have, you plant one seed and you get one apple, that's not very profit-minded. Because, and if you plant the apple and it has no seeds in it, it's really bad. But God says, no, I got this world set up so that you plant this one seed and it will produce a tree and then that tree will produce more apples and every apple will have seeds in them. But someone said, you can count the number of seeds in an apple, but you can't count the number of apples in a seed. There's just, just no way. It's just gonna proliferate. And that's, that's God's plan. He likes that. He said, yeah, let's do that. Let's make it that way. Now, what he said in 1 Timothy 6, though, was, he said, if you are minded to be rich, if that becomes the most important thing in your life, you fall into temptation and snare of the devil. Because you're on a treadmill. You, what's a treadmill for? Well, you... <laughs> You get on it to get exercise. Right? You say, you watch a guy on the treadmill and say, where are you going? He said, nowhere. I'm on a treadmill. I'm, I'm just walking. Oh, why? Well, I'd like to be healthy. Oh, okay. But you're not going anywhere. No, I'm just going and standing in place, walking. God said, I want this thing to work. He said, you can't take your riches 
and invest it out here in the world because when you do, he said, uh, thieves are going to break through and steal it, moth and rust are going to corrupt it, and you're going to wind up poor. At the same time, he said that I, if you'll give it to me and handle it like I tell you, he said, I will prosper you. A little boy went to the grocery store, one of those old timey grocery stores, and uh, <laughs> the owner was like the owner when we used to go down, we always ran up a bill, you know, at those little stores we used to have. And uh, we'd go down there and dad go down and pay the bill. Of course, when he was going to go pay the bill, I wanted to go with him because the grocery owner said, uh, come over here and get you some of this, you know, whatever. I'd get it free because we paid the bill. And uh, I heard the story of a little boy that uh, went with his dad to, to get that, and they paid the bill, and then there was a big old jar of candy, and the owner said, son, come here and reach in and get your hand full of that candy. And he just kind of looked at it. He didn't do it. He said, no, come on over here, son, and, and reach in here and get, some, get you a handful of candy. He didn't move. Finally, the grocer just reached in and gave him a handful of candy. And his daddy said when he got outside, he said, son, what was the matter with you? He told you to get a handful of candy and you wouldn't reach in and get it. He said, daddy, his hands are bigger than mine. <laughs> He's dumb like a fox, you know. And and what God has said, if you give it to me, I, I'm going to give my hands back and you'll get it. So if you're looking for your needs in life and you want to survive physically, he said, I hear you. I know all about it. You want to know where you fit in? I'll tell you how to fit in. You, you got ambition? No problem. Go right to the top by going right to the bottom. Serve everybody. And they'll, they'll lift you. And then I want you to know that if you're trying to accumulate things, let me tell you, you, you live your life like I tell you. You invest your life not in things that perish, but in treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't corrupt, thieves don't break through and steal. It's totally safe. When you die, it's all there waiting for you. He said, I'm telling you, this is real. This is life. And even though kids think God doesn't know anything about the atomic bomb because it's too new for him and he's too old, I believe he's the one that put the world together and made the atomic bomb and the atoms there possible for it to actually become a bomb if we use it or to become power to be used. But God said, this, this is what you need and I know every one of the reasons that you need it, and I've, I've prescribed how you can be happy, satisfied, and uh, your life will make a lot of sense. All right, we're right dead on target. Get out. So uh, we'll try to keep you each time no more, and we'll somewhere down the road we'll let you ask questions if you want to. But. If you'd just like to hear me talk, you can just stand there and let, sit there and let me talk. But if you want to ask questions, that'll be fine too. So if you have a question, I would suggest you not try to remember it. Write it down. Write it down. Okay.